Hi, my name is Scott Travis, and welcome to Backstage Pass. Today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about my favorite instrument, and uh, you can guess what that is. And um, I'm going to talk about and show you some of the things that I've learned over the years and some of the practicing procedures, and hopefully you can use them and, uh, and make yourself a better drummer. Um, I'm a self-taught drummer, and most of the stuff I've learned has either been through watching other drummers or picking stuff off of records or just, just learning some of the common, common knowledge that uh, drummers, drummers possess. Um, so let's get on with it. And before we uh, continue, I'd like to talk a little bit about my equipment. The, uh, the drums I'm using are the Tama Grand Star drums. Um, they're seven ply birch and uh, we'll go through all the sizes, starting with the tom-toms. Up here we have 12 by 13, 13 by 14, 14 by 15, 16 by 18, and 18 by 20 floor toms. Uh, the bass drums are two uh, 18 by 24 inch kicks. Um, snare drum is an eight by 14 Artwood snare drum, which is a uh, eight ply birch. Um, over here we have a six and a half by 14 timbali. Um, all the hardware in the cage is also manufactured by Tama. Uh, the pedals I use are Tama Pro Beat pedals. And um, I'd also like to explain something about the beaters I use on the pedals are made by Danmar. And uh, they're heat treated. The, the difference between these and, and regular beaters is the shafts are heat treated so they don't bend and they never break. Now, I'm going to use this as an example as like a beater. If this were a beater on your bass drum, a lot of times, or maybe it's never happened to you, but I know from experience that sometimes a beater will break, and when it breaks, it breaks right under the felt part, and it's usually in the course of you playing. And then when the beater flies off, you don't know it, and the shaft goes through the head, so then you're out of a beater in the head. So it, it's kind of beneficial just to get some uh, beaters that won't break or bend. Um, and uh, all, the, all the rest of the hardware is, is by Tama too, especially the cage. Um, the cage to me is, is one of the more revolutionary things to come along in drumming for a while because uh, it, does, it has a number of assets. The first one being that uh, it looks cool. And you know, after that, everything else is uh, irrelevant. But um, the best thing about it really, though, is the fact that, that everything is in its place night after night. I'm a real particular drummer, and if I do a gig one night and when I come back the next or, or I have someone setting up my drums, I want everything in place. If a, if a ride cymbal or a, a cymbal stand is moved you know, a half inch one way or the other, it really bugs me. So with this, everything's locked into place and it, and it stays the same night after night. Um, it all has memory locks and everything, so it pretty much you know, goes together the same way every night, too. Um, it's also real sturdy. Um, it, you know, you can support the, the tom-toms on the cage as opposed to having them on the bass drum, where sometimes if you kick a bass drum, the resonance might, might uh, vibrate through the, the tom shaft, and it tends to make the tom-toms the hum. So uh, to me, I just think it's a, it's a really great piece of equipment. Uh, the symbols I use are Peisty, uh, symbols. They're all the reflector series. They're real shiny. Um, I'll go through these starting with the, the, most, uh, the most symbols I have first, which are 18-inch crashes. These are all 2002 mediums. I have five of these, two here, two here, and one here. Then I have uh, two 20-inch crashes. Uh, these are the, of the Peisty 3000 variety, and these are uh, power crashes up here. I also have two 16-inch power crashes, these two right here. I have a 20-inch power ride, which is also a reflector, a Peisty 3000, and a 18-inch China type reflector over here. Now I have two pair of hi-hats, uh, one for both arms, makes a lot of sense. And uh, to me, you know, when you when you think of uh, when you think of the the main essential part of a drum set, it's usually hi hat, kick, and snare. You know, those are the things that you really want to sound good. And I think that the the Peisty hi hats, I think they they sound great. They have the sound edge bottom, which is patented. It's a rippled bottom, so whereas you won't ever get any airlock in there when you. Uh, when you do something like that, they'll never lock up, and they sound really great, either closed, closed tightly or really loose. And when you do, do something like that, it has a real loud chick, and um, everybody wants a loud chick once in a while. Um, it's also beneficial to me because a lot of times when I do uh, just ordinary 2-4 uh, you know, beat, I'm always playing eighth notes with my hi-hat, so it would sound like this, just to give you an example.
as you can see, sometimes I use the Hyatt as, as a sort of a metronome, and it usually always keeps going, and I can't stop it. Okay, and the drum heads I use are all Remo pinstripes um, on all the toms, kick, and the floor toms, everything else. Um, the sticks I use are Vic Firth, American Classic Rock, and I use the butt ends. Um, that's just a preference of mine. You can use whatever you want. Um, and one more item that I'd like to talk about, which I really think it's overlooked on a drum set, and to me is one of the more important, because it has to do with the drummer's comfort, and that's the stool. And Tama and Vanetta, this is kind of a, a revolutionary idea, too, because in the past, most drum stools are just round with kind of like a dome top. But as you can see, this one's kind of shaped like a bicycle seat. And uh, if you look at it from this angle, it also has kind of a lip in the back, which gives you a little bit of back support and helps you keep your balance. And like I said, uh, out of everything, this is, uh, this is a real helpful item for, for any drummer. OK, before we go on, I'd like to talk a bit about now about the key role of the drummer, and that is to keep good time. Um, I think that's something that tends to get overlooked sometimes by drummers. You know, when I give lessons, uh, kids come up and they always want to know how to do this fill or this fill or that lick, and I try and stress the importance of playing good time because uh, you know you could have the coolest the coolest solo and the and the hottest licks, but if you can't keep good time, then you're going to be virtually useless as a drummer. And uh, what's the point of having all these great chops if no one's ever going to hear you? Um, the best ways to practice or to, to, to check your time or to play or to practice uh, in time is obviously with a drum machine or a metronome. Uh, metronomes you might not really be able to hear, and then they have this one that has a light on it that blinks, and I don't know about that one either. Um, drum machines are really good, and I have a drum machine here now, and I'm going to demonstrate for you. I'm just going to try and play some simple time and uh, see how it comes out. Playing with a drum machine might sound real easy, but uh, it can tend to get pretty hard because a machine is, uh, it's a machine, it's perfect and it has impeccable timing and it's not gonna, has no flaws in it. And it really helps nowadays even more than ever because a lot of records are using drum machines and virtually everybody owns a drum machine nowadays and so if you're gonna do something or if you have an application or whenever you go into the studio, um, chances are you're going to be required to play with a click track, which essentially is a drum machine. So it really helps. Now, if you can't afford a drum machine, um, something that I used to do and still do to this day is to play with records. Um, you know, I'd have my stereo and I'd have my headphones, and I'm talking about headphones in one second, try and get some that encompass, that, that cover your ears, not ones that like on the Walkmans or something, because then your drums are going to be really loud, you're not really going to be able to hear the music. But uh, in playing with records, I found that that's a really good source of, of practicing, and also if you're not playing with the band, then you can put on any record you want, and there you are playing with your favorite groups, you know, no matter who they might be. Um, so that's, a, that's another good form. And another uh, thing to do is just play with the radio. Um, in, every, in every town, they usually have these uh, top 40 type uh, contemporary radio stations, you know. And most of that type of music, dance music is what I'm referring to, most of that type of music uses a drum machine. And usually the drums or the, uh, the rhythm section are pretty loud in the mix. So you can turn your station to that and put that on, and uh, you don't necessarily have to play the exact figure they're playing. You can just get the groove and you know fall into the tempo that they have, and then you can play all around that. But like I said, chances are the, if they're using a drum machine, it's going to be pretty spot on. This next section of video I'd like to uh, devote to playing paradiddles and applying them to the drum set. Now, some of you more advanced drummers are going, oh my god, not paradiddles. Those are so simplistic. But, uh, I think I can show you some things that maybe you never thought of before to take something really simple like a single paradiddle and to come up with uh, all kinds of stuff out of it. Uh, there are three, the, the paradiddles to me are the, are the most useful, or one of the more useful of the 26 rudiments. Um, it definitely helps to know them all, but chances are in a rock situation you're not really going to use a Rademacue too many times. So um, 
A single paradiddle is just a combination of single stroke and double stroke rolls. And uh, it's a great hand exercise. And like I said, I'm going to show you some things that you can apply on the drum set, which will help you out. You can come up with beats. You can even turn into a solo. OK, let's start with the single and probably the, more, the, the single paradiddle, which is uh, the most common. And that, is, that goes as right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And I'll demonstrate it now. Okay, with that, you go, well, that, that doesn't really sound all that hot. But once you build it up to speed, um, the accents and the ghost notes will kind of fill in. And ghost notes are the lighter notes where you're not hitting every stroke with the same intensity. It would be like this. Okay, so now I'm going to build it up. I'm going to start it slow, and then I'm going to build it up and see what you think. Now we're going to go on, we're going to go to the double paradiddle, which is just two more notes. So it would be right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. Example of that. And then we have the triple. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. Now I'm going to put all three of them together. I'm going to do four measures of the single, four of the double, and four of the triple. And then I'm going to go back to the single and, and start it on from there. So it would sound like this. OK. Now, like I said, this is a good exercise for, for both hands, in particular your left hand. Um, and instead of doing it just on the snare drum, you might want to carry it around onto the tom-toms because generally your snare drum's tuned much tighter than your tom-toms and you're going to get more of a bounce. So by doing it on your tom-toms, you're going to have the strength in your left hand and your right hand for that matter too. And like I said, these are just, these are just things that uh, can be applicable you know, in a rock situation or just playing you know, generally any type of music, it can be, it can be used. Now, getting back to the single paradiddle, you could take something like that and you could play it, take your right hand, same thing, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, and take your right hand and put it on uh, the ride cymbal or the hi-hat. In this instance, we're going to use the hi-hat and I'm going to close it up a bit just for the sake of clarity, okay? And you're also going to follow your right foot with the right hand. So essentially, you have these going right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, and I'll give you an example of that. If you notice, what really makes that, like I said earlier, are the ghost notes. And when you first start practicing it, your hands, um, you'll probably be hitting everything with the same amount of intensity. But once you get the flowing motion and it becomes more comfortable, your hands will start to relax and you'll get the ghost notes. I'm going to play on my leg and just let you hear some of the ghost notes just on the left hand. Now you can hear the difference between the ghost notes and the accent. Um, 
Now going back to that beat, the single paradiddle over here, uh, you could do that or you could just play straight uh, eighth or quarter notes with your hi-hat and let your foot do the same thing. So I'm going to open up the hi-hats a little bit now because it'll turn more and sound more like a beat. Okay. Once again, all that was <clears throat> was a single paradiddle, and I was just playing quarter notes on the hi-hat. Now I'm going to show you something that you can really take something simple like a single paradiddle, and you could get, literally, you could get eight different beats or figures out of it. Now we're going to take a single paradiddle, uh, as you see on the screen now, like right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Okay, we're going to consider that an eight note pattern because there are eight stickings, eight strokes there. Okay, now if you take that pattern and let's get another pattern out of that. Uh, let's say we start the pattern on the sixth note of the single paradiddle. So as you can see how that would be, that would be right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left. Okay, and like I said, if you, if you put it right under the single paradiddle, you can see how it's derived from the single paradiddle. You're just starting it at a different area. Now I'll demonstrate that for you on the snare drum, the new pattern. Now once again you hear that and you go, well, that sounds okay. But what we're going to do now, we're going to apply that as a, uh, apply that in the form of a beat on the drum set. I'm going to start it slow and speed it up. And like I said, the key thing to remember is when you first start doing it, it might not have the accent and the feel, but once you become familiar with it and it becomes more comfortable, the accents and the ghost notes will really, really start to have a feel to it. Okay? Here we go. play it on the ride symbol for you too because then you can if you play it on the bell of the symbol uh, you can it has a better sound to it okay and that's just one variation out of something simple like a single paradiddle. And like I said, that's just by starting the pattern on the sixth note of the original single paradiddle. You could start it on the seventh note or the second note or the third note or anything, and, and eventually uh, you, could, you could have eight different patterns out of a single paradiddle. Okay, and uh, I'm going to demonstrate for you now playing uh, the single paradiddle and the double paradiddle uh, as a beat or, or as a, rhythm, a ryth rhythmic thing um, using the hi-hats and the snare again. I'm going to incorporate the single and the double together, okay? And uh, in this new configuration, the bass drum is following along, right along with the right hand. It's doing the same thing the right hand can, is doing. So we'll go through that right now. Like I said, that's a really neat pattern, and you don't necessarily have to do the bass drum just like that. You can do the bass drum on samba beats, or play the bass drum just on uh, quarter notes, or you can do all sorts of configurations. Another thing uh, to do is to take one note from the left hand and place it on the right hand. So instead of going right, left, left, right, we're just going to go right, right, left, right. So that would sound like this. Okay, 
So uh, those are some good things you can do with paradiddles, and um, I think you'll find them very useful. And uh, just practice some of the things I showed you. And write, or take a paradiddle, a single paradiddle, and you could write it out like, like we showed you there, and just do all sorts of stuff with it and change it around, and you can come up with all sorts of configurations on your own. All right, the next uh, topic I'd like to talk a bit about <clears throat> is triplets. Now, some of you more advanced drummers are going, oh my God, he's not going to talk about triplets and milk this, is he? But uh, I came up with some things that um, I think will help you out and will take a, an ordinary triplet feel and uh, just make it sound a bit more interesting. Now, triplets, as we know them, are counted one and uh, two and uh, three and, uh, and so forth and uh, And I'll demonstrate that for you now. Okay, so when you apply that triplet uh, figure to the drums, I'm just going to replace one of those notes and put the bass drum in its place. Um, and that would end up sounding like this. Okay, now I'm going to incorporate some of those configurations that I just showed you. I'm going to incorporate them together and uh, around the drum set, and it should sound pretty interesting. So you see, when you put both of those uh, configurations together, it sounds pretty interesting. And if you were to uh, just hear that on a record or maybe even see a drummer do it in concert, you wouldn't really be able to see everything that he's hitting over here like these cameras can pick up. Uh, it would probably sound a lot more complicated than it is. So you, know, you can practice that, and hopefully you'll come up with some cool stuff. OK, now I'd like to discuss and, and share with you some various uh, hand exercises that I developed. Um, they're nothing new, but uh, there's just some things that I use. Generally speaking, uh, if you're a right-handed drummer, chances are your right hand is going to be a little bit stronger than your left hand. So when I practice and I'm by myself, I try and do things to work to strengthen my left hand, to try and get it up to part of my right. Um, one thing that, that's pretty helpful is just to do a triplet, uh, but do two notes on the left hand and one on the right. So it would be like left, left, right, left, left, right. I'll demonstrate that for you. OK? And when doing that, um, I, try, I concentrate and try and keep the left hand coming up as high as the right hand. In other words, I don't want it to sound like this. Because when you're doing that, you're kind of cheating yourself because the left hand is doing a lot of buzzing and it's just, uh, it's just bouncing off the snare. You're not using really a whole lot of strength to, to actually bring this, the uh, stick back up. Um, and a good way to practice so you don't do that, rely on the tension of the snare drum to get the bounce, is to do it on your tom-toms. Because like I said earlier, uh, your tom-toms generally are tuned, uh, are a little bit looser and uh, not as tight as your snare drum. So by doing it on the tom-toms, um, you really have to use your hand strength. You're not so much relying on the, the bounce of the snare. So um, I'll give you some examples of that. Okay, and something else I use, uh, which once again you could almost use as a solo or uh, a, a fill or something like that, is to keep the left hand stationary on the snare drum and bounce around with your right hand and either hit cymbals or just hit the drums. I'll give you an example of that.
Okay, so you can do uh, multiples of those, and uh, you don't necessarily have to do triplets. You could do double stroke rolls around the drums or anything else for that matter. Um, another thing I do to strengthen my left hand, uh, years ago, um, I started playing uh, the, the ride, I started playing the hi-hats with my left hand, you know, using as a ride in, in a song. Uh, for two general reasons. Number one, like I said, to strengthen my left hand. Also, it makes more sense. Uh, you know, you have your hi-hats over here. Uh, I have right hi-hats and left ones, so if I want to play right, I got my right arm. If I want to play left, just made more sense to try and utilize that left arm. For instance, you don't play uh, your ride symbol like this. It's just a bit uncomfortable, so uh, I started playing with my left hand. Now, when I first started doing it, um, obviously I wasn't real smooth at it, so I just practiced on my own, played with records or whatever, and uh, eventually became pretty good at it. Because um, <clears throat> generally, when you just play a, a, an open 2-4 beat, or 4-4 beat with the uh, snare on 2 and 4, um, you know, you're, and if you're playing quarter notes over here, your right hand's doing four times as much as your left hand's doing if you do a beat like this. So it only made sense to me to try and carry the left hand and do that same figure. Okay, so that's something you can do. Um, another thing that uh, I found helpful, I, I once again use the philosophy that anything my right hand can do, my left hand should be able to do. Now, if you take a, a common figure, uh, which most every drummer knows, let's say something like Wipeout, okay? Now, I'll, I'll demonstrate that for you. And all those accents there are with my right hand. So now I'm going to play it with my left hand. OK? And uh, using that general philosophy uh, with all single stroke, everything I just played there was just single stroke 16th notes, OK? And the accents is what made them sound really hip. OK, another thing that I, I found helpful uh, is a 16th note single stroke roll. Um, actually, it's, it's a six stroke roll with the accents on the one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And I'll do that starting with my right hand and the accents. Well, I'm going to do two accents on the one and the two, and the accent starts with the right hand, so it'd be like one, two, one, two, okay? Now, take that same figure once again, start it. Uh, you can start it with your right hand or your left hand, but when you do the accents, start the accents with your left hand, it gives it a little bit better, it gives it a different feel. And it, uh, it also helps to get the chicken swing in there, and then you, you really get your hands moving. But uh, you got to kind of watch how you might take off if you get going too fast. OK, uh, is what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the same roll. I'm just going to accent it. I'm going to switch the accents around. In other words, I'm going to do right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right. But it's the same six note pattern. They're all 16th note. Okay, and as you can see or hear, um, you can get some pretty interesting things out of that. And once again, you don't necessarily have to do that exact pattern. You can do any type of pattern or any multitude of strokes. Um, 
and just accent on different hands. You know, if you accent, if you're used to, you know, most drummers, it's real comfortable to accent with your right hand and do everything with your right hand. Just practicing on doing things with your left hand, even if it's just moving your left hand around the toms or becoming familiar with those. Anything you do uh, can't hurt, and it, it should it should help you. Um, another exercise that uh, that I use, and this one. Uh, does two things. It helps your hand speed and also helps you to familiarize yourself knowing where all your drums are all the time. Uh, most drummers, when they do a roll, they're playing a beat and they do a roll, they do it descending, going down on the toms. Uh, going up on the toms, ascending is a little bit different story. So I kind of use these exercises um, to do both, like I said earlier, hand speed and to know where all the drums are. I'll start with something real simple, but when you build it up, it actually becomes pretty hard. It'll just be all 16th notes again, single stroke, two, uh, two strokes on each drum, and then back up again, ascending and descending. Okay? Try this. So as you can see with that, um, it, it really gets harder the faster you go to keep it really smooth and even without hitting the rims and the cymbals and your legs and anything else that might get in the way. But that's something to remember. Is try and hit each drum in the center. You know, each two strokes, you want it to be in the center. And another key thing to remember, which also applies to everything else that I've showed you uh, previously in this video, and which I'll show you uh, continuing in the video, is if you make a mistake, don't stop and, and just sling your sticks against the wall. Just slow it back down to an even pace where you can do it. You know, because if you're doing a, a, a figure or any type of anything, if you're doing anything and you make a mistake and you stop, uh, then you have to remember the last thing you did was a mistake. So you don't, you never want to end on a mistake. If you're doing something, you start to mess up, just slow it back down to where you can do it comfortably and then try and work it back up to speed. Okay, and uh, you also, another good exercise is to do more strokes on each drum. In other words, you don't have to do two on each drum. You might try four, sixes, eights, anything else you want to do. And just do it all the way around the drums and back up uh, until, you know, don't do it until you're in excruciating pain in your hands, but just do it so you can feel yourself get a little faster and feel your, your muscles stretching. I'll give you examples of fours and uh, some other multiples, okay? Okay, and like I said, so uh, those can be real helpful to you in developing hand speed and strength and also learning to, uh, to familiarize yourself with your drum set. Um, another thing you can do uh, when I was talking earlier about trying to utilize your left hand more by playing things, uh, let's say if you're going to do a, a, a beat, you know, play the, the ride figure with your left, left hand like I demonstrated. Uh, also learn to hit your cymbals with your left hand and just try and be more conscientious of the left side of your body and your left hand. For instance, something else that you could even do household chores such as brushing your teeth. You know, like I said, if you're right-handed, everything you do is with your right hand. You change the, the TV with your right hand, you brush your teeth. Well, try and do things with your left hand. It'll just help it become that much more coordinated and it definitely will help you in, in drumming. Um, and then one more exercise I'm going to show you. Uh, involves uh, the cymbals and the drums and um, this once again is a four note pattern uh, it would be two on the cymbals and two with your hands they're all 16th note six strokes and this just helps you out because this helps you get familiar with where your cymbals are um, you know I have a lot of cymbals here uh, and that's why I have a lot, because you just swing and eventually you're going to hit something. But uh, seriously, it helps to, to know where they all are to be able to have access to them. You know, some drummers you see, they have cymbals way up here and way up here, and you know they never hit them. Well, everything I have, I feel that I can hit without turning my body around and swinging one way or the other. So here's an exercise that, that I'll help you to.
Okay, now to conclude uh, the, the section here about hand exercises, if you remember we talked about earlier the paradiddles, single, double, triple stroke paradiddles, um, and then in the hand exercises we were talking about accents, just doing single strokes, 16th note rolls, accents where they are, and, uh, and varying, varying them around the drums. So now I'm just going to give you a little example. I'm going to try to incorporate all those in there at different times, and you'll see how, uh, what you can come up with, okay? scary part of the video and uh, we're going to talk about uh, our feet, at least my feet. Um, <clears throat> before we get into some double bass exercises which I've used and still use, uh, I'd like to talk about the importance of being able to play with one bass drum. Uh, not too many people just started out with double bass and uh, you know most people started out with single bass so once again I don't want to de-emphasize single bass but going right to the double bass because I think single bass is really important you can utilize it uh, in a lot of different in a lot of different areas um, some general exercises I use just to strengthen the feet uh, once again going to the triplet feel uh, where it's one and uh, two and uh, uh, with this I would play the one and the and with the foot and then end it with the ah on the hand so it'd be Okay, as you can see, uh, that's a good figure in strengthening your foot. And once again, you can carry that around and, and play it on all the toms. Uh, you could play it in the form of a beat by taking your right hand and just doing quarter notes or eighth notes. And then once in a while, um, you would leave out one of the snare beats and then it would, it would kind of turn into a beat. I'll give you an example of that now. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> those are good exercises. Now, if you noticed here, I'm sure you can see my feet, that when I play my bass drums, my foot uh, is not really um, on the pedal like this. It's off to the side and it's back. It's probably midway to the pedal. Um, the shoes I use, just any, any good rubber-soled shoes will work, uh, work pretty good. Um, now, once again, you take that same philosophy as I said earlier, anything the right hand can do, the left hand should be able to do. So I use the same philosophy here with the feet. If I can do that with my right foot, then I should be able to do it with my left foot. And these are exercises that I find real helpful, especially in double bass, is practicing with my left foot. Once again, even double bass drummers, you know, they play so much with their right foot and their left foot, they only use it to play 16th notes, uh, rise, or something like that. Um, so then I'm going to give you the same example that I just did, except I'm going to play it with my left foot. Okay, once again, <coughs> uh, the thing to remember when doing that is at first, you know, you're so used to playing with your right bass drum. When you first start with your left, it might be a little bit uncomfortable, it might be a little bit shaky, but you have to kind of stick with it. Now, for some of you drummers, you're going, well, that's pretty easy. Well, I got another trick for you that might be a little bit, make it a little bit more difficult. And that is to play everything left, just left side of your body. That means you're going to act like you're a left-handed drummer. You're going to play the ride and the snare with your right hand and put your left kick over here. Um, that's something good to practice with, and uh, any any common beat, you know, if it's a beat in 4-4, four, four, 
uh, you know, just your ordinary rock beat, just take it over and try and play with your left hand. It becomes much more challenging and doesn't become quite so, so mundane and easy. So uh, I'll play a few things around here. Okay, as you can see, that's a pretty simple pattern, but when you play it with your left foot, it becomes that much more challenging. Um, if you have trouble playing or, or if you have trouble remembering what your left foot's supposed to do, when you're playing the beat, you might want to start with your right foot and then switch over to your left foot, and I'll give you an example of that now. Okay, now that we have that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the double bass. And uh, when I first started playing double bass, as I think most double bass drummers, um, you just start out playing a figure that sounds something like this. Okay, that's pretty simple there, but uh, like I said, I want to show you some things that I've used uh, to come up with some songs that I think are, are fairly interesting. Um, one philosophy or, or one exercise you can do is just using multiples of twos, fours, and sixes uh, between your hands and your feet. I'll give you an example of this one. Uh, on this one, I'm going to do two notes with the hands, two with the feet, four notes with the hands, two with the feet, six notes with the hands, two with the feet, and so forth. I'll demonstrate that for you now slowly. Okay, and you can work that up to, uh, to get that pretty fast, and you can incorporate it in all your drums, um, and it might be used in a situation that would sound like this. So as you can see, it could have an application like that in the context of a song or anywhere or a solo or whatever you wanted to use it as. Um, some other things I, that I've used, and or that thing right there that I just showed you, the, the two on the hands, two with the feet, four on the hands, two on the feet, six on the hands, two on the feet. You could turn it around and do the opposite and do two on the hands, two on the feet, two on the hands, four on the feet, two on the hands, six on the feet and just play it as a consecutive pattern which would follow each other and do it around the toms and do it any way you wanted to do it. Okay, another figure that I came up with that I use in a song called Hammer Away with Racer X uh, is a six note pattern. Uh, when I start the song out, uh, it's a six note pattern. The first note is snare, the other five are bass drums. Uh, and I do that twice, and then I go six, six notes with the hands and six with the feet, and then I go into it, and it's kind of a six-eight triplet feel, uh, the, the beat of the song. So I'll give you an example of that right now. Okay, and I'll do that one more time just to demonstrate. And uh, I'll do the six-note pattern. Uh, I'll do it over and over again so you can see exactly how it goes, okay? And if you notice that when I started off on the first note uh, with the snare drum, the bass drums are not hitting. 
And uh, in other words, sometimes when you play patterns like that, it's real easy for your snare hand to hit on the same note as either your left bass drum or your right. But when I do that, I stop the bass drums, as you, as you can see by my feet. Okay? So that's a figure that I came up with. Uh, and I use in Racer X, and uh, I'll play it for you the sped up version. Okay, another configuration I came up with is by playing twos and fours with your feet. In other words, you might do two hands, four feet, four hands, two feet, and play that in a consecutive manner. These are all six, play them as 16th notes also. I'll do that for you. I'll demonstrate it slow and speed it up. A song that has uh, has that in its context is a song called Lady Killers. Another good thing to help your hand and feet coordination with cymbals is to play the same thing. Uh, you maybe do four with your hands, four up top, six with your hands, six up top. Uh, spread it around and do all sorts of cymbals and stuff like that. I'll give you an example of that right now too. And it also, this is also a good exercise because it helps you uh, to familiarize yourself with all, where all the cymbals are in conjunction with playing double bass. Okay, and like I said, that can be a real helpful exercise. Um, it'll strengthen your arms because you have to swing your arms up really high, and it's just an all-around good exercise, I think. Okay, next part of the video uh, in this double bass section, I'm going to show you how I came up with the idea behind Scarified. Uh, once again, I adopted the philosophy, if your hands can do it, your feet can do it. Um, when I spoke of earlier in the double bass section, I spoke of the common the 16th note uh, the 16th note ride that everyone does with their feet, you know, doing daka 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 daka, and it just seems to me it, it was getting kind of old, you know, to hear that over and over again on records or in concert or whatever. So uh, I came up with the idea, you know, if you can do, uh, I'll demonstrate it for you now on the bass drum, and then I thought, well, why not try and do it with the with the? I'll demonstrate it on the snare drum, and I thought, why not be able to do it with the bass drums? As you can see with that, basically those are just 16th notes, and then it ends with a rough. And the rough is a four-stroke rough, as opposed to three or whatever you might have heard in the past. Um, you know, like I said, the idea came about because if you do a roll uh, and you finish it with a rough, that might sound like this. And then I just applied it and, try and learned to do it with the bass drums. So if you put all that together, 
um, that's how I came up with the Scarify, the intro. Basically, the song just, that, that's the, uh, the main intro, and it does that throughout the song. Also, just using that general idea, like I said, I just got bored with hearing the same 16th note patterns on the bass drum, so I started to throw that rough in there, and uh, I'll give you an example of that. I'll just play like four measures of straight uh, 16 note on the bass drums, and then I'll put some of those roughs in there, okay? Okay, well there you have it. I hope you can take uh, some of the things I've shown you today and put them to good use. I uh, hope to hear from you and thanks a lot for tuning in and I'll see you backstage.
Thank you.